Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, we still see some folks joining in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, joining us today for this virtual session. Uh, this event is with EPA's Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization and the Office of Air and Radiation, and it's hosted by SAIC. Uh, today's event is a small business virtual event. Uh, we're we're wanting to allow EPA and specifically the Office of Air and Radiation uh, to share their upcoming acquisition forecast and outlook for contracting as well as some background on the Office of Air and Radiation and some new projects that are on the horizon. Uh, we are extremely honored to have two wonderful special guests with us who will be speaking with you today from EPA. Uh, the first is Denise Benjamin Sermons, Esquire, who is the Director of the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization at EPA, and Eleanor Marushak, who is the Deputy Director for the Office of Program Management Operations within the Office of Air and Radiation. <clears throat> My name is Jim O'Keefe. I am your MC and host today. I am also the SEIC Account Manager for EPA. So just a little bit on the structure for today's event. Um, we're going to hear from our two guests from EPA, and I will follow up with some additional information around SEIC's background and presence at EPA, as well as some additional information uh, for small businesses to help you uh, get in contact with EPA, as well as our small businesses program director. Um, so, you know, hang on, and there's plenty of contact information there that we're going to be sharing with you to uh, reach out and get some more information. Um, we'll also end the session with a QA and a um, that will be uh, moderated, and we'll go through some questions that you may have there, and again, uh, give you some opportunity to reach out to us and uh, touch base with us if you have additional questions. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over first to our first guest speaker, uh, Denise, to discuss the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization at EPA. Welcome, Denise, and thank you so much for your time today. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, James, for that great introduction. Hopefully, you can now hear me. Well, um, I'm just really excited to be here with you all this afternoon. I particularly appreciate the inf invitation from SAIC to join you. And so I really want to give a big shout out to Rita Brooks, who heads up their small business program. Thank you, Rita, for inviting us to be here this afternoon. And you assembled an incredible team to assist in coordinating this. And so big thanks also to Ron and to Jeff and Beverly, and I'm sure I missed a lot of folks, but they in particular had to do a lot of hand-holding for me, unfortunately, to get me hooked up and, and, and acclimated to all of this. So guys, thanks for all the extra work that you did on my behalf. Um, so again, I'm, I'm excited and it's not surprising because as the director of EPA's Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, these are the things that we enjoy most, opportunities to interface with small businesses. But I have to say that I'm particularly excited at this time to have the opportunity to inter interface with you all, just given the changing landscape on the federal level um, as a result of the new Biden-Harris administration. I mean, we at EPA, and I'm sure all of the federal employees are doing the same in keeping a very close watch on some of the priorities that are emerging from the administration and some of the bold and really aggressive out of the gate priorities that I'm sure many of you are hearing include the COVID response, of course, revitalizing the economy. We've heard a lot about climate change and the priority there, but also uh, we've heard about the racial justice and the equity uh, pillars that the Biden administration is going to be working on. And so all of those priorities identified to date really implicate what we do at EPA. In particular, for my own office of small and disadvantaged business utilization, we're definitely focusing on the revitalization of the economy piece um, that is intimately tied to our mission as we work to promote and support small businesses, especially since small businesses are the engines that drive economic growth. But I'm sure many of you are focused also on the climate change piece, which obviously is at the heart of EPA's mission. But let's be honest, it's still early in the administration, so we're not really in a position where we can specify the specific shape and form 
that that particular priority will take at EPA. Nonetheless, we are here to share with you um, just a little information about the agency to get us prepared for that big and bold focus that EPA will be working on in the coming months and years. And I have to say that we are very privileged to have joining us for this conversation, Eleanor, who hails from the Office of Air and Radiation, um, which we know will be championing a lot of the climate change. And I have to tell you guys, in, in case you're not aware, that um, Ella and I go a little ways back. We work together in the Office of um, Acquisition Solutions. But what's important to know is that Eleanor is really a seasoned contract official, having served as a contracting officer and really amazing in contract policy development. But now what I think we're going to benefit much from her perspective as a senior official within the Office of AIR. And so she'll be sharing a lot of the good work that she is doing based on her dual backgrounds to really increase the utilization of small businesses within the air office, which is really desperately needed. So yeah, I'm excited for a lot of reasons. So what we'll do, and if we can move to the next slide, I'll take the lead uh, with the discussion and um, I'll sort of set the stage for Eleanor and just get you a little bit acquainted with the agency profile, you know, the background stuff on our mission and our structure. Then we'll move into a glimpse of our contracting activity, focusing on um, the small business activity within EPA. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the opportunities in terms of the tools and resources that are available to you. I'll then turn it over to Eleanor to do a deeper dive um, on some areas that I think will be of interest. All right, next slide. Let's go ahead and get started with EPA. You, I'm sure you're all familiar with our well-known and well-respected mission, which is essentially just to protect human health and the environment. And of course, that includes air, land, and water. And how we're organized, as many of you may be aware, is um, we have our headquarters offices, which essentially do a lot of the policy making and the implementation of the statutory mandates. And depending on how you count it, we have like 12 or 13 headquarters offices, and they range from the media specific offices, such as AIR, as we talked about, the Office of Water and the like. We have several support offices that do a lot of contracting, such as the Office of Mission Support, which is huge, um, that they include um, the contracting office, HR, they even include IT. So that's a really big one that you wanna keep your eyes on. Um, also in terms of support, you have folks like OCFO, the Office of the Chief Financial Officer and OGC. The one um, cross-cutting office that I'll mention is the Office of the Administrator, which is where my particular office sits in. All right, next slide. So that's our headquarters. Um, like many of the other agencies, we also have regional offices, 10 in particular, and they kind of mirror in structure the headquarters alignment. Um, and that's something that the previous administration kind of did a little bit of reshuffling of the alignment to make sure that there was a little bit more synergy uh, and so what you'll find in the regional offices is that you'll, you'll see that they have their own contracting officials, their own grant offices and the like. And so we work very closely with their contracting office and within each of the contracting offices, they have a small business coordinator who depending on where you're located, you'd wanna get familiar with as well. Next slide. All right. So my office, as we continue drilling down, as I mentioned, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization is located in the Office of the Administrator, as we are required to be by statute. And we too have a mission that's aligned with the agency's overall mission, and that is to support the protection of human health and the environment by advancing the business, regulatory, and environmental compliance concerns of small businesses. And as you see on this slide, we have primarily two functional offices. The first is the Small Business Solutions and Opportunities. We affectionately refer to that as our SBSO office. And we do in that office all things small business contracting. We are a little different from some of the other federal agencies that we have a second arm 
And with respect to this arm, we house what we call the Asbestos and Small Business Ombudsman Program. And that's a statutory creation that essentially works with small businesses to ensure that we reduce the regulatory burden on them and that we help with environmental enforcement and compliance. And so we serve as a liaison and an ombudsman to assist small businesses in that area. Next slide. Together, we really work to educate, engage, and enhance as an, an, an office. And so we really work to educate both our internal stakeholders, so the program office, the contracting offices, offices to make sure that they are familiar and well-versed in the small business requirements. But we also work to provide some training and education and technical assistance with the general community, particularly small businesses, but we work in partnership with large businesses and trade associations and the like. The engagement piece is really critical as we try to institutionalize within the agency what we call a small business first culture. And so that really is the heart of our commitment as an agency to support small businesses. So that's a critical piece that we perform. And then finally, which I'm sure many of our small businesses in the audience are most concerned about, is really we're looking to enhance the opportunities for small businesses and ensure with respect to the contracting piece that they are utilized in the agency's acquisitions. Next slide. All right, so that's a little bit of the background. Let's talk um, about the contracting activities. So this chart basically reflects the five year spend for the agency as a whole. And you'll see that we kind of hover around the $1.6 billion every year. Last year was a bit of an anomaly and we don't have a specific reasons for that, the reason for that. But last year we were a little lower at 1.4 billion. Next slide. So just as our overall spend for the agency is pretty constant over the extended period, this slide gives you a sense of what the small business percent or amount of the dollars are for the agency as a whole. And in percent wise, it really is about 40, maybe 39% depending on the year, but it's pretty consistent throughout the year. And that's actually a quite a significant amount for an agency to spend with small businesses, uh, particularly as we're a mid-sized um, agency. Um, we were very successful for maintaining a record of excellence in supporting our small businesses for well over 12 years. So that's a, a record that we're really proud of in earning uh, the scorecard grade of A. And of course, the scorecard is what the Small Business Administrator Administration administers to just see how agencies are doing in performing and complying with their small business requirements. Next slide. So this basically shows our last year for the uh, most recent completed scorecard. And uh, you'll see that we, we did earn an A. Um, we didn't meet all of the goals, unfortunately. We were a little low for hub zone and women-owned small businesses, but we're hoping that this year will be a banner year where we achieve all of the goals. Next slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what where we contract and, and what it kind of looks like. Um, first up, uh, it would be our top NAICS codes, and there's no surprise there. Based on our mission, you see remedial services, environmental consulting are among the areas that we do the highest concentration of acquisitions and contracting. But certainly uh, in the general areas, they're reflected here as well. But this is good to know as you consider whether EPA is the agency you would like to market your commodities and services based on how much contracting we do in particular areas. Next slide. I know what's really important to businesses large and small is getting a, an appreciation of what the vehicles are that they should be trying to get on, particularly in the age of category management. And so this slide gives you a sense of what the popular vehicles are at the agency. 
And like many of the federal agencies, you see the schedules, the GSA schedules that we tend to utilize the most using fiscal year 20 data. Um, we also um, use some non-GSA multiple award vehicles such as NASA SOUP. Um, but these are the type of vehicles and schedules that you'll see from a lot of the agency. And of course, things are changing a little bit with the consolidation of the schedule. Next slide. And I'm keeping my eye on the time because we want to make sure we afford enough time for Eleanor to um, share with you some information from her office. All right, so for those of you who are really strategic in your marketing of your products and services, so you're not only looking at particular agencies, but some of you are looking at offices because you know some offices are more small business friendly than others. And so uh, here we're sharing with you some of the top small business spenders for the offices across the agency as a whole. And this is quite surprising to see that Region 4, which is located in Atlanta, is really far up there. So you know that they are a very small business friendly office and organization within EPA. But I will challenge you to consider that even those offices that don't currently do a lot of small business spend, um, you can bet that we are leaning really hard on them. And so they too are looking for opportunities to increase the participation of small businesses in their acquisitions. So they do present some opportunities for you all. Next slide. All right. So where are we with goal achievement? Um, well, the short answer is it's really too early to tell. But we did want to share with you what things are looking like to date. And um, based on the five goals and the percentages that are reflected, it looks like we're doing famously. So we're excited, but we know that much of the contracting actually occurs during the third, but particularly the fourth quarter. So we know there's lots of work to be done, particularly in the hub zone area, which is still a little low. Next slide. All right, so let's move into opportunities. We've talked a little bit about EPA to get you acquainted with the agency, what our contracting profile looks like. So where are the opportunities? And so this gives you a sense of what our current forecast is reflecting in terms of what we're planning over the next three years to include this current fiscal year. And I will say for those of you who have not yet looked at our forecast acquisition, I think it's one of the better acquisition forecasts than we've had in several years. We spent a lot of time scrubbing the data to make sure that the actions reflected are more current, accurate, and provide more um, precise points of contact to follow up with. So I do encourage you to take a look at that. But if you see here um, for fiscal year 21, we have 179 actions projected in our acquisition forecast um, and we have two quarters remaining we're about to start the third quarter so you can imagine there's a lot of work to be done so a lot of opportunities for you all um, many of those are already identified as small business opportunities which is always a good thing but i will tell you that in Osdebu, even with those that have been identified for small businesses we review them very closely to see how we can better leverage all of the socioeconomic categories the agency is responsible for affording opportunities to. And then, of course, with the full and open ones, there are 38 of the 179 identified for this fiscal year. And those are being scrutinized even closer to see if there are some small business opportunities there. And there's still some undecided even at this point. Um, so additional market research is being done to definitize the actual structure of those acquisitions. Um, and with respect to, to those, um, what we're really trying to promote as the office is the vendor engagement. And so not only relying on some of those old tools and techniques through you know, sources, thoughts, or requests for information, but we're really advocating as an office that organizations bring in the small businesses to meet with them and inform them uh, better on how the acquisitions that should be structured. And so hopefully over the next few months, you, you will see some opportunities to engage with our program offices. Next slide. <coughs> Pardon me. So opportunities are listed 
of course, in our forecast acquisition. But there are other opportunities for businesses to participate in acquisitions on the prime and on the subcontracting level. And that is really through teaming arrangements. And so I can't overemphasize um, what of a brave new world teaming arrangements open to all businesses. Um, there's one acquisition we're looking at now actually with Region 4, um, where we're looking at a really good teaming arrangement. This one between um, two smalls, but one that has a terrific socioeconomic category that we need. And so these are great opportunities for you to explore. So this slide lists some of the top large primes for EPA. And by top, I mean those that have the most dollars. And so you see SAIC is right at the top and, and it reflects uh, part of their commitment to small businesses and to the agency as um, also indicated by them hosting today's event and some of the other ones that are there. Next slide. So as I mentioned, great teaming with large businesses, whether it's a, at a prime or subcontracting level, but also teaming with small businesses to complement your own capabilities, experience, and maybe deficiencies in your past performance records. These are some of the small uh, businesses that do a lot of work with EPA, and some of you may recognize some of the names. All right, next slide. So as we wind down, um, just to highlight some of the resources that can help you all get some of the information, um, the last one listed on the left column for the EPA uh, resources is, of course, the acquisition forecast. So that's a, a great hyperlink that will get you right there. Or you can also just do a search once you get to epa.gov for acquisition forecast, and it'll take you with all those great opportunities. Um, also, a good one, working from the bottom up, um, our active contract list. So that will give you a sense of what contracts we have that are coming due to expire. So that's a great way to start preparing. It'll also let you know who some of the contractors are that we're working with. So you can reach out to those vendors if you see opportunities for you to team with them as a joint venture or otherwise. And then we have our Ozdebu site, um, which has uh, some great information there as well. And we're actually in the process of retooling that. And we're going to be adding some great information on our site over the next couple of months. So please stay tuned for that. And then some government-wide resources are listed. Oh, sorry. Um, and that is um, just information for you to find out more information about subcontracting opportunities and primes that you might want to partner with. So um, that is the last slide, and I see we were jumping the gun because we're all excited to hear from Eleanor. So I'm going to turn it over for Eleanor to dive a little deeper and share with you some information on what's afoot in the Office of Air and Radiation. Eleanor, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Denise. That was great. I actually learned a few things. I did not know about the asbestos ombudsman. <sighs> so. Thank you, and um, I, on behalf of the leadership of the Office of Air and Radiation, uh, thank you to the SAIC folks for hosting this event and for providing the EPA with this chance to discuss our important work and how you can help. Again, I'm Eleanor Marushak, and I'm the Deputy Director of OAR's Program Management Office. I'm also the Senior Budget Officer for Air and Radiation and I'm heavily involved with contracts and grants for OAR. As Denise said, she and I go way back. We uh, tried to crack some tough policy nuts when we worked together in the contracting shop. And so that's been a good working relationship all these years. So thank you for that. Um, so I've been with the EPA for about 21 years now and served in many roles. And what I really enjoy the most is being in the program office with our policymakers and scientists uh, using those bilingual abilities uh, to really make a difference. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the mission of the Office of Air and Radiation, how we accomplish our mission through contracting, and what OAR's efforts are to establish more effective contracts, and why I believe that it's important to have solid partnerships, not just within uh, EPA, like Denise and I have, but with our vendors outside as well, in order to achieve our goals. 
because really um, having an advocate like Denise uh, for small businesses at EPA is the best thing that you could imagine because she is what keeps folks like me in the program office honest and continually striving to improve uh, the, our utilization of small businesses and coming up with things like teaming arrangements between small and large businesses. Next slide, please. So you're probably aware, as Denise said, that at EPA, our mission is to protect human health and the environment. But more specifically, in the Office of Air and Radiation, our mission is to address climate change, improve air quality, restore the ozone, and minimize uh, people's exposure to radiation. And these are incredibly important tasks that directly affect the health and the well being of our citizens and the environment. And we do all of this through national programs, technical policies, and regulations for controlling air pollution and radiation exposure primarily through the Clean Air Act. But you know, really, um, if you wanna get down to it, lives depend on the outcome of our work. And we all know about asthma, and you can imagine that as air pollution increases, asthma is made worse. But did you know that 11 Americans die each day and more than 4,000 each year from asthma? And did you know that children of color suffer from asthma at twice the rate of white children? So this makes asthma not only a public health crisis, but an environmental justice crisis. And the pollution reduction of both indoor and outdoor air and addressing the climate change that we work, um, the work that we do here in air and radiation, just simply put, saves lives. Nearly everything we work on in air is linked to reducing air pollution, ultimately improving air quality, and it will measurably save lives. So let's dive a little bit into the OAR program so that you can get a better feel for what we do. OAQPS, or the Office of Air Quality Pollution Standards, they regulate stationary sources. And I like to think of that as like smokestacks, right? And they capture air quality data uh, via national network of monitors with actual filters that huge volumes of air pass through and are sent off to labs and analyzed. And then we report that data onto sites such as Air Now. And if later you uh, put into your search engine airnow.gov, you'll find some really cool uh, air information. And you can see some very interesting trends uh, since we've all been locked down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, but they use that airnow.gov data on all the weather stations when they tell you what the air quality index is that's coming from those EPA monitors from air and radiation. The Office of Atmospheric Programs, there are greenhouse gas emissions people and climate change folks. And they do work related to international treaties like the Paris Climate Accord. They also have public private partnerships such as the Energy Star. You may be familiar with that in your personal life related to the energy efficiency of light bulbs and appliances. They're a big player in the climate change, yes. Um, the Office of uh, Transportation and Air Quality, OTAC. They regulate the mobile sources. And these are mainly cars and trucks, but really just uh, all kinds of equipment, even lawnmowers and snow blowers or those backpack leaf blowers that you see landscapers use. If it emits and it moves, OTAC probably regulates it. They also set uh, fuel economy standards, which is the um, miles per gallon MPG that you see on the window stickers when you buy a car. And they have a very large and interesting lab in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, you guessed it, near the uh, big three auto manufacturers. Any car or truck, tractor trailer, it doesn't matter. If it's sold in the U.S., even if it's made outside of the U.S., like Volkswagen, you may be familiar with that saga, uh, it must undergo rigorous testing at this site in Ann Arbor to ensure compliance with the EPA standards. And the last office I'll talk to you about today is ORIA, the Office of Radiation and Indoor Air. Uh, 
and the radiation is just a small program that's really related to monitoring and regulating the Department of Energy's nuclear waste. I mean, it's a big issue, but it's a small part of what the work that they do. And I think that um, ultimately we have that because it would maybe be a conflict of interest for the Department of Energy to regulate themselves. So um, they do work um, like in the Yucca Mountain, Nevada for nuclear waste storage. Because it, you, know, you, can, you, you may know or you can imagine it continues to emit uh, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands, I'm not a scientist, what the life, uh, half-life is of those uh, radiation uh, uh, waste products. But we also have radon from the earth and that's an indoor air pollutant. And there are other indoor air pollutants that that program covers like asbestos, volatile organic compounds or VOCs, often found in carpeting and furniture, things like that, mold, burning wood indoors. And then they also handle the public service announcements for asthma and other indoor air uh, issues that we have and other air pollutants throughout, throughout our environment. So let's move on to some specifics of what OAR is contracting for in order for us to meet the mission objectives I just mentioned. Next slide, please. So when I joined uh, Office of Air and Radiation in uh, 2017, I noted the volume of standalone contracts that we have. It's 80. Well, relative to what? But I'll tell you that um, it's twice as much as any other national program at EPA. And uh, it caused a lot of challenges uh, for us to try to maintain uh, the, the, the pace of placing those contracts one after the other, administering that volume of contracts, just keeping track of that many contracts. It was a real challenge for us uh, without adding additional resources. And at EPA, we want more scientists. We want more economists. We want more policymakers. We don't want more contract administrators. So how can we do this in a, in a little bit more streamlined way? And there were also a lot of demands um, to in, improve our contribution to the agency's small business contracting goals. Thank you, Denise. And the desire to identify or build a cadre of small business vendors that could support our mission and the continual struggle to use best practices required by OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, or GSA, such as uh, strategic sourcing or spend under management, which is something new uh, in the past year or so that we've been uh, told, listen, you need to buy smarter, not harder, and you need to use a lot of existing uh, resources out there like the GSA schedules. So we set out to understand um, what these highly delegated OAR programs were buying. And we wanted to bring a level of expertise to bear for a broader uh, enterprise approach that we could manage more centrally. I'm not saying I'm a control freak or anything, but um, we do think that we can bring some intelligence uh, to this operation and we would like to buy smarter, not harder. And so we need to understand more fully what we buy. So in 2019, we analyzed our spend and we learned, according to this slide here, that 70% of the OAR annual spend is for professional services, specifically for management and advisory services. We also learned that there were dozens of small businesses, many of whom uh, were or had been uh, contractors uh, you know, for doing work for us right now. And they seem to be positioned to help meet our requirements through direct contracting. So we're buying professional services and then more specifically management and advisory data analysis here. You can read this for yourself. Uh, and I think they're gonna share the slides at the end because this I think is some interesting information. So next slide, please. So some level one data from the federal reporting system, uh, FPDSNG, illustrates that 73% of the spend is on professional services. So it's $70 million a year in the Office of Air and Radiation uh, on professional services. And you can read the details of, these, of this breakdown at your leisure. And um, 
I know when I was looking through these slides my staff provided the other day, I noticed that like uh, fourth up from the bottom, weapons and ammunition has a little asterisks next to it. No, we don't buy that uh, in the Office of Air and Radiation. It's actually uh, fire suppression systems for our auto emissions lab in Ann Arbor. But I thought it was interesting and I would note it here because, you know, that's driven by the North American Industrial Code or the NAICS Code. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, that tells you sometimes those aren't um, um, as reliable or uh, as um, illuminating as we might think that they uh, otherwise would be. But let's look down at the level two uh, data there on the uh, spend. 98% of that spend is within these top areas. So we have professional services. We, we buy mostly management advisory services. That's $60 million a year. And then there's some more categories down there, IT outsourcing, IT software, test and measurement supplies. And I had mentioned those air monitors and filters. Um, we also have big radiation monitors. Um, if God forbid, you know, if another country were to send nuclear um, uh, missiles across to the United States, these um, monitors would pick those up in a heartbeat. We actually were picking up the Fukushima radiation from the um, uh, tidal wave that they had in Japan. It was, uh, what is it, six or eight years ago, we were picking that up on our radiation monitors. So as we look at that level two data, um, you can see that's very interesting, but I suggest that we look a little bit deeper. Next slide, please. Oh, you're on the next slide. Okay, very good. So um, in those, um, so, so as I said, we have the 80 contracts and in those 80 contracts, we discovered that 30 of them have very similar statements of work. So that's a little bit troubling. Um, we just keep, everybody wants to have their own separate contract, uh, every branch, every team. Well, that's a lot of effort uh, to administer all those contracts and a lot of effort for our contractors to be proposing on that number. Um, but we find these following areas of um, uh, uh, tasks in those contracts. And then you can see the statement of work count. So for example, under business analysis, economic impact analysis, 11 of the 30 statements of work have that in common. Um, 16 of them have training under business operations. Regulatory analysis under policy support there, it's 13. So you can get now a little bit bigger picture of the frequency of what we're buying in those task areas. And I imagine that this is where you all can start to see the work that you specialize in. So right here, this is the bread and butter of OAR's work. So if you like that, let's just look a little bit deeper. Next slide, please. Very good. These are the task areas where we have the bulk of our work represented by the percentages where they occur again in those 30 similar contracts. So um, now you've really seen the whole picture, the bulk of the work from 10,000 feet down to the granular level, right? Data analysis and modeling, policy reg support, operations and communications. This is what we're buying the most of. Mm -hmm. And so you ask yourself, what good does this uh, information do you if there are currently few opportunities on the OAR forecast? Because I trust that some of you might have another computer open. And right now you're looking at that uh, EPA acquisition forecast and you're looking under the Office of Air and Radiation, maybe to even ask me some specific questions I hope I can answer. Um, if we don't have a lot right now that isn't already uh, almost fully baked. We just have a few. Uh, for testing and modeling support uh, for some equipment maintenance. But as I said, OAR really uh, is invested in creating enterprise-wide contracts and we want to employ best practices promoted by OMB and GSA. And we want to increase our contracting with small businesses. Next slide, please. So to that end, we are right now working on the pre-award package for an OAR-wide contract whose statement of work will encompass most of the task areas that we just looked at. We want to create OAR's first ever performance-based contract for professional services. 
Other programs at EPA have had professional services contract. Um, we just engaged in a week long seminar to completely rewrite our statement of work to exactly model what is supposed to be in performance based contracting, um, not just throwing a label on it, but really rethinking and rewriting it. Um, we want to have an award with multiple vendors, both large and small business tracks, and we want to do all of this using the GSA schedule. So we will be partnering with GSA for a vendor day in just a month, I think um, in late March, I believe, but the date isn't quite firmed up. And we're going to be working with Denise's office uh, in early May for a virtual vendor day. And we expect the request for information or RFI to be released in late April from the contracting shop at EPA. And we're going to release this RFI for 45 days, which I understand is something novel as well. Um, but we're really, and for that length of time, but we're really encouraging feedback on the structure and the content of that eventual RFP. And we're hoping that the 45 days for the RFI will signal that we're serious about getting feedback from the vendors. My acquisition aspirations for this vehicle will be to meet the policy objectives of spend under management as, as uh, given to us by OMB and strategic sourcing, which is an uh, EPA goal and small business utilization, and really to create a smoother, faster ordering process for the program office, which would result in higher quality and timely task order packages sent to the contracting shop. Uh, hopefully uh, for easier competition among the awardees, especially if it's performance-based approach, which I believe will foster vendor creativity and approach and hopefully, hopefully <laughs> decrease labor costs. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, OAR looks forward to hearing more from you about your companies uh, and how they can help us meet our important mission. And I'm interested in hearing your thoughts as we release our RFI in April, early May of this year. So I thank you for your interest in our program and look forward to hearing your questions in a moment. All right, thank you so much, Eleanor, and thank you so much, Denise, for your time. I think uh, all of us understand how busy our EPA uh, um, you know, folks are and uh, taking the time to do this really shows the commitment not only for EPA, but also uh, certainly for SAIC on uh, small business utilization. Um, and also, as, as uh, you know, as Eleanor mentioned about Denise's talk, we always learn something new um, in this. And I will actually mention uh, how important these events are to attend and to understand, um, you know, uh, EPA's mission and, and the, the various missions in the media offices as well. Uh, so thank you again so much, Eleanor and Denise, for such wonderful information and for uh, providing uh, updates on what's going on and, and uh, particularly OAR and the, the professional services contracts and the combination of those contracts. What an incredible uh, initiative that you've got going there, Eleanor. And I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for folks to um, engage with OAR and, uh, and for Eleanor to be able to bring a, a very large and uh, consolidated contract to bear uh, for OAR. So again, thank you, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, and information on this. Um, as many of you have seen, there is a Q and A, um, a call out box below, and folks are asking questions there. Uh, we will be picking out some of those and answering them uh, and in the Q and A session right after my slides. Um, so if you have questions, please enter them in there. We may not get to all of them, um, but we will certainly uh, take them into account and try to feedback as much as we can uh, on that. So again, thanks so much, Eleanor and Denise, for for your time. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to. Talk talk about SAIC and our, our long relationship with uh, with EPA, as well as our, you know, we have a very strong commitment, I do personally, to uh, small business utilization throughout our federal contracts, and uh, also talk a little bit about how to connect and work with SAIC uh, at the EPA and throughout our federal space. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jim O'Keefe. Uh, I am the EPA account manager for SAIC. I'm also the program manager uh, for EPA and user services. Uh, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a slide or two. Uh, I've been supporting EPA for 22 years, so I'm right there with you, Eleanor. Uh, so I am obviously biased about how awesome I think the EPA is. <laughs> 
So uh, if you hear me gushing, you'll understand why I've uh, I've spent many, many years supporting this wonderful agency. Uh, and I, I am absolutely committed to continuing that uh, that support. Um, I can speak from experience, too, as well. And many of you uh, have had experience across the federal space. Uh, EPA is truly an exceptional customer um, to work with. You know, the agency has really, truly dedicated uh, public servants um, that are really focused on the EPA mission that, you know, um, Eleanor kind of alluded to of, of um, human health and the environment. Um, but also one of the aspects that is so energizing to me is, uh, is the focus on collaboration and partnership um, that we get with the agency. It really has allowed us to build kind of dynamic teams. And what I really liked about um, one of the comments that Eleanor made is, you know, uh, as contractors, we, we, we should be excited about this. We should be excited about bringing uh, new technologies and opportunities to EPA. That's what we should do and can do best. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we should do that uh, and make sure that we continue to, um, to uh, arm EPA with the latest and greatest uh, capabilities that are out there. Um, so we are truly honored to be a part of this event. And again, thanks to um, Eleanor and Denise for taking the time to allow us to present with you. Um, so I'm gonna start with a quick background of SEIC uh, here. You've been looking at the slides. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because many of you probably know uh, SAIC. Um, it, we are a $7.1 billion company uh, with over 25,000 employees. Um, they are located all over the world and throughout the continental United States. Um, we focus on civilian defense, national security uh, groups supporting contracts throughout the federal government. Um, we have a focus on you know, IT support, uh, mission, mission enablement, engineering um, services, but we also have a broad range of other capabilities. And what's really interesting, and I'll get to this too, as Ellen or alluded to, program offices are really interesting uh, for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is that they are all unique. Um, so you never have a, a dull moment or, or, or any kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, any kind of confusion that if you're w of what uh, program office you're working with because they have their, their very specific missions. Um, and I will call out here the, the National Vehicle Fuel Emissions Lab that uh, Eleanor was referring to in Ann Arbor. If you ever get a chance to go there, you really should. Um, I had an opportunity, we used to run a contract up in Ann Arbor. And uh, I actually saw, for those of you that are car buffs or may know car buffs, uh, cars, I'm not really one, but they had a McLaren in in the bay at the National Vehicle Fuel Emission Labs, and it was painted in camouflage. Uh, so anyway, the EPA, there's never a dull moment. And that one in particular is a fascinating place to visit. So if you ever get the opportunity, uh, take advantage of it, the National Vehicle Fuel Emissions Lab in Ann Arbor. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, uh, we support a broad range of capabilities, not only throughout the federal government, but also at EPA. And we have a, a very strong commitment and focus for our employees, a commitment to you know, diversity in our workforce, and also in flexibility in the, the deployment of mission solutions. I think we've all seen a radical change in how we provide IT services and, uh, and mission support services to our agencies throughout the last year or so. It's been a, a completely unique situation um, where we've had to be flexible and had to be, uh, um, you know, bring a lot of capabilities to bear to support this, uh, this new environment. Environment. All right, so next slide is um, a little bit about, uh, sorry, Ron, can I go to the next slide, please? There you go. SEIC um, at EPA, and as I mentioned, it, it even exceeds my time uh, at the agency, which is kind of uh, amazing. Uh, we've been supporting EPA for over 30 years with both IT services uh, and application development support. Um, there is a long storied past of us um, providing support throughout the IT and application development realm. Um, right now on this slide, you can see some of our current deployments. Uh, we have over 400 staff on the ground at EPA today. Um, all over the country, we have 30 plus locations. So uh, we do a lot of support, of course, for um, the enterprise IT services, but also a lot for program offices. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the next couple slides. Um, but for end user services, as I mentioned, uh, it's our largest program, 330 plus people on the ground today. Uh, and, and that contract is, again, um, as Eleanor mentioned, you know, this is one of those type, uh, types of consolidated contracts, which we're seeing more and more of not only at the EPA, but throughout the federal government, um, where there are very large combined services types, con types of contracts. And this one is an example of that, uh, where we provide everything from enterprise IT service desk, desk side support, uh, mobile devices, um, AV services, um, engineering support, just a whole suite of capabilities. Um, but also we pepper out uh, support into the regions and program offices um, for IT support services and other things like that. So uh, again, it's a very broad ranging um, you know, contract with a lot of different capabilities 
capabilities out there, which, which we love. It's very exciting. Um, but we also provide at the bottom of that, you can see we have over 70, 70 people uh, providing application development support on the ground today. And the uh, application development support is very, very focused on our program offices or media offices. Um, and that's always exciting too, because we have kind of the best of both worlds, a little bit of enterprise support. Um, and we also provide support to headquarters and also the media offices and regional offices. So we get a little bit of everything across the entire range of the EPA community, which I love. Um, and also to kind of tack on to uh, Eleanor's Air Now uh, website, um, one of the applications that we run is actually on the front page of epa.gov. Uh, so, and I'd uh, throw out a, a little uh, a little ad here because it's really cool. Uh, to Eleanor's point, when you go to these websites and see the incredible analytics and data that come out of them, it's amazing. So you're going to definitely want to follow her links and also uh, just go head out to epa.gov uh, uh, today. Our uh, our, our application is at the bottom under your community. You can actually click down there and, and uh, it allows the public to learn about environmental c conditions in your location and what's going on in, in your space today. And, and what's really interesting about that is, as Eleanor mentioned, there's so much interconnectivity of data coming from everywhere. The Office of Air and Radiation has tons and tons of inputs coming from all over the place, not the least of which is states, tribes, local authorities, all of those kinds of things. And that's what the, the uh, EnviroFact system, which is sitting behind that that your community tab on the on the website uh, does. It, it connects and consolidates environmental data um, and provides kind of a single pane of glass uh, on environmental conditions around the country. So really, really cool. And we love doing that. Um, and additional support on the right hand side of the slide, we support, the, as I mentioned, the regions. Uh, we have direct support on the ground in regions five, six, and 10 as a part of the regional IT support services contract RITS. But we also have some folks uh, supporting in user services that are on the ground in uh, regions four, six, and eight. So we're a, a little bit of a, a little bit of support everywhere. And that gives us an opportunity to really, uh, you know, understand um, our customers and understand the missions of these uh, regional and program offices. Because like I said, and you'll hear me say it over and over again, even the even the regional offices have various different focuses. So it's really important to uh, make sure you understand those customer requirements and pain points. Uh, all right, so next slide. I'll oh, um, uh, as we're leaving this one, on the right-hand side, it lists out some of the areas that we support, so take a look at those. Um, this is not by any means a, a definitive or comprehensive list, but it gives you an idea of some of the places that we have a, a large preponderance of staff supporting uh, EPA on the ground today. All right, next slide. So support for climate change initiatives, and I really like this because Denise brought this up as well. Um, you know, our focus is really to continue to, to provide value uh, through customer intimacy and access to services and contracts. Um, so, and in particular, SAIC has a focus of continued growth in the media offices. Um, and, and as you heard Denise mention today, the, the program offices have um, a lot of, uh, of contracting needs and requirements, and they're very, very specific. And we want to continue to grow and support that in addition to enterprise support services um, that we provide. And I wanted to just stay here for just a second uh, to offer, uh, you know, some experiential uh, information about working with uh, working with EPA. Uh, one of the challenges that I think we've seen over the years um, with small businesses engaging with the agency is uh, potentially bringing solutions and services without fully understanding pain points and the mission of the particular media office or regional office. Um, so one thing I would say is, um, you know, take the time to understand the true pain points. Uh, in many cases, program or media offices have a sea of regulatory compliance requirements that they have to navigate, um, relationships with states and tribes, as you heard me mention, um, integration with EPA financial systems, IT systems, enterprise uh, infrastructure, contract administration. Um, so a lot of times it can seem frustrating for a small business to in try to engage with the agency on a solution um, only to have it kind of turned down uh, out of hand and maybe not understand why. And a a lot of that has to do with um, this challenge of bringing solutions to the EPA with an understanding of the customer needs. And, uh, you know, we certainly want to help with that and also reaching out to the individual program offices and learning about those environments, um, the EPA Working Capital Fund or the financial services that sit behind a lot of these contracts um, will help, uh, you know, us as contractors be able to provide really good, um, uh, you know, solutions that are tailored to EPA and that live and are contextualized within the EPA environment. So please keep that in mind. When you're when you're reaching out to the program offices, take time to understand them if you can beforehand. There's a lot of great information online, and also certainly reaching out to um, you know to Denise will absolutely help you get connected to uh, information about the program offices. If you do that up front, you'll save everybody, uh, including your your future customers, some time. So 
um, just uh, take that with a grain of salt as some per personal experience that we've got uh, in dealing with that. Um, so the last thing uh, the the uh, last thing I'll mention on this slide is again um, we are focused on continuing to grow our supportive environmental initiatives um, that it's huge for us policy and science at EPA uh, while we continue to kind of expand IT and mission ser services supports um, so you know as as uh, Eleanor mentioned and Denise mentioned climate change is is in the news quite a bit um, you know and that continues to drive you know it takes center stage and drives uh, potential funding and opportunities there. Um, you know, as you saw with some of the contracting dollars uh, in general, um, it, you know, it, let's say in the in the past four years or so, um, the, the science side of the house was probably the most impacted with budget impacts. Um, and that that hopefully will be uh, kind of relieved a little bit coming forward. But like and you said, it's it's still evolving. But we, we we're all hearing climate changes on the radar for everybody. And we are certainly uh, focusing on that, uh, you know, from a, a, um, a company perspective and also in the service of EPA. So uh, keep that in mind. We want to leverage best practices across all of our contracts in the federal government. Government, because we're not only hearing it at EPA, we are hearing that uh, that discussion elsewhere, NOAA and other locations and other uh, organizations that are involved in uh, environmental services. So again, keep that in the back of your mind. And the last thing I'll say here is we are in a lot of places. Uh, as I mentioned, we um, we serve the entire enterprise through end user services. We touch 11 of the 12 program offices um, through the Working Capital Fund and other services. And OAR is on the top of the list. Uh, we love working with uh, with uh, Eleanor and her team uh, to provide applications application support services and also other development support services in IT. Um, but we also support, as you heard me mention, uh, many of the regions. And we'll, this will take you to the next slide so we can kind of walk through. You'll see at least a little bit of where uh, SAIC is located. So, uh, Ron, if we can get to the next slide, and I'll be wrapping up shortly. So again, uh, you see the Office of the Administrator and the Headquarters Offices, as Denise mentioned. Um, they, uh, the Headquarters Offices, a lot of times you hear, you'll hear them termed media offices or program offices. Uh, we provide support to almost all of them, and we've actually worked with uh, OITA, which is the International and Tribal Affairs Group. Uh, we just don't have any direct work with them today. Um, but we do a lot of different types of work. Not only do we provide IT enterprise support for a lot of these uh, program offices, but in particular um, with you know groups like OAR, we do application development support and you know mission support services for uh, many of these program offices. Um, ORD is a big one. We provide uh, on the ground resources at all of their labs for uh, desk side support services and IT management. Um, you know for uh, Office of Water, we're working with them right now on uh, uh, Salesforce application development uh, pieces as well. So there's a lot of and, and ServiceNow also. Um, so a lot of work is going on between um, the, the program offices. And as I mentioned before, we're at a lot of regional offices, four or five. Six, eight, and ten right now. Um, EPA continues to move towards consolidated services of uh, IT, um, you know, infrastructure. So you will see more of that reach kind of extending out into the, the regional offices going forward. So uh, we're very excited. We've, we've, uh, like I, I said, we've got a focus on EPA. It's one of our, our uh, primary accounts. It's obviously everything that uh, I've been working on for 20 years, and we continue to want to grow that and expand out. And one of the areas we believe that small businesses can help with is targeted expertise in, in a lot of the media offices. Um, those are the kinds of, uh, of things that small businesses tend to be really, really good at is expertise capabilities within a, a, a very defined area. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about, well, how do you connect with SAIC and what do we look for in a partner? Um, so it's, it's really straightforward. Um, um, uh, you heard Denise mentioned the NAICS codes. Um, those are important, uh, as you can imagine. Um, you know, we have uh, a series of NAICS, NAICS codes that we support. It's important that you have those um, if you want to specifically work with SAIC within the the um, you know within the context of the uh, of our contracts that we're working on today. So take a look at those NAICS codes. But what's interesting, Denise also, and I think maybe Eleanor mentioned it too, is you know, this can be misleading sometimes. So don't use that as the only criteria to decide whether or not you want to work with us or with EPA, um, you know, be flexible, um, but take a look at them. That, that is a starting guide to get you started. Um, past performance with customers, absolutely vital. Just a FYI, you heard me say customer intimacy is everything. Um, and as I mentioned with EPA, it is super critical, uh, you know, in the, you know, deployment of capabilities for program offices that you know them and understand their mission. Um, experience with SEIC is always great. We have specific processes and procedures that we use with our subcontractors um, and small business partners. So, you know, it always helps to have those pieces. Unique innovations are awesome. We really like to bring that capability to the, the, 
the EPA and we have vehicles and ways for you to do that and work with us um, to help bring your capabilities to the federal government in a in a structured way. One of the things that we do really well is understanding how to, um, you know, how to manage the, the EPA environment from a contracting perspective and financial and funding perspective. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we try to help our, our small business partners with is, yes, I have this thing. How do I get it into EPA? And we can help you walk through some of those things as long as there is an absolute need and a, a pain point that it answers for the for EPA. Industry certs are really important. And as you heard, um, you know, Denise uh, mentioning socioeconomic statuses are always very critical. Um, security and facility clearances are important. Uh, you know, they're not always absolutely required, but they do help. Um, the NIST guidelines for, you know, managing controlled unclassified information. It's very important to have that that uh, wrapped up and very well documented. So please keep that in mind. And then also we like to we like to work with our our small business partners uh, through ex from proposal through execution, the whole the whole nine yards. We want you to be a part of that. Sometimes that can also be helpful for you to see that process in action um, and uh, and and potentially also you know be a part of it and engage very early on in the solutioning process. We take a lot of uh, you know uh, focus to our small business partners to listen to them and understand um, the expertise that's being provided by our small business uh, teammates. So um, last but not least, I, I do want to mention um, that uh, the additional item that we look for a lot, and, and you'll hear me talk about this all the time if, if we ever have a one-on-one, -on -one, is um, integrity around you know uh, delivering service to the customer. Please have that focus. It's very important for us to be able to um, you know have integrity in customer support and management. So how, how do you as a small business get started? Um, next slide, please. This is it's super simple. Uh, you send an email to smallbusiness at saic.com. Uh, and in the body of the email, uh, just include these items. And, and by the way, I did see some questions in the in the Q&A. Uh, this is re being recorded. It's, it'll show up on uh, on uh, SAIC's website. Um, and I have the link that I will also include uh, to send out to all of the uh, all of the participants around uh, the location of that. Um, so yes, you will get these slides and you will get this recorded uh, content. But again, please please make sure you're including the information in the in the questions about the program or agency you're interested in, specialty, uh, business size, security clearances, a lot of the things that we just talked about on the previous page. Super helpful. Um, and also always make sure that you're including your capability statement. Um, that's very helpful in us to not only try to understand what you do and, and who you are, but also where we can connect to you throughout the federal space. Okay. And I think I'm done. We, we just about hit it on, on time at, uh, at 3.30. Uh, so next slide. Um, these are some points of contact for you on the SAIC side. Uh, Alan Ashby is the, the Senior Vice President over Civilian Markets. Um, if you know him or would like to get in touch with him, uh, I am the EPA Account Manager and as I mentioned, a Program Management Resource for any of you to ask questions. We want to be here to help. Um, as I mentioned, EPA has done a phenomenal job with their small business utilization and they have a focus on small businesses and, and utilizing your capabilities. So don't, uh, don't lose sight of that. It's important for you to, to understand that this is an, a very positive agency for small businesses and SASC has a commitment to support that as well. We also have our small business program office contact, Rita Brooks, uh, who again helps to set this thing up. Um, one side note I will mention is that we are, uh, we will have uh, callbacks. We're, we're planning on doing a, um, uh, it would essentially be a, um, invitation only matchmaking event after this once you follow up with the email to small business small business at sac.com we will be setting up one-on-ones to talk with you and, and provide you additional information um, and just as an fyi the slides are located at saic.com forward slash s is in sam b is in boy p is in paul and they'll, they'll show up next week as well all right, so we'll jump into that's that's it for me. Thank you all so much for for uh, your attendance and attention uh, throughout this entire process. And again, we're here to help, so please reach out, uh, and 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 uh, we're happy to point you in the right direction. Um, the Q and A will focus on EPA, so we'll um, we'll ask Denise and Eleanor uh, to come back in, and I'll start handing off some questions. Again, we may not get to all of them, um, and uh, we'll try to be cognizant of certainly EPA's time, but also yours as well. Uh, and if there are additional questions that come in, you can send them to to us and we'll be happy to uh, um, support those and answer them at a later time. Well, I'm sorry, I'm getting some uh, feedback. Okay. Um, so we will move to our Q&A. The first three that, that are out there, 
um, are uh, ones, Denise, that we'd like you to uh, address if you wouldn't mind. Um, is EPA planning to use the consolidated GSA MAS schedule? And Denise, I'll let you come off mute if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, I think Eleanor has done a great. I think we have some feedback. Maybe Jim, if you mute. Um, I don't think it's me, but I hear it too, Ron. I'm not sure if there's where that's coming from. Sorry. I'll mute as well, Denise, just in case. All right, thank you. And I'm I'm not sure what question you were reading, but Eleanor has done a really good job in answering, I believe, the questions in the Q and A. Um, and the question you just asked me was. I'm oh, sorry, I think you you're right. With, yep. No, ma'am, you're you're right. Um, I do see them them having been answered uh, there. Thank you. Okay, great. Eleanor, you're amazing. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So Eleanor has been addressing most of the questions that we've come up with. And oh, yes, Tracy, I can. Uh, so Denise, I think I think we're covered on that one. Sorry about that. Um, OK, so and I did see Tracy, you asked for a location of the slides one more time. Um, it is SAIC.com slash S is in Sam, B is in boy, P is in Paul. And the recording will be out there and you'll be able to view it. And I am seeing that we're, we're at 3, 3.35, so we've actually gone over just a few minutes. So I apologize for that. So um, I think we will. what we'll do is, since Eleanor has been addressing a lot of these questions as we've gone and we're out of time, I want to be sensitive to uh, everybody's time and, and give everyone an opportunity to uh, um, you know, get their questions answered. We will, we'd love to follow up with you if you have additional questions. Um, so do please reach out to the contacts that were included in this, uh, in this document. We will be sending out some follow-up information uh, to those that have registered. And uh, we thank you again for taking the time to meet on this. We do want to continue this dialogue and to continue to encourage small businesses, not only at EPA, but also throughout uh, the federal space and SASC. We'd love to be a partner in that. Again, want to thank Eleanor and Denise so much for their in, in insightful and, uh, and descriptive information that they've provided us not only on EPA's uh, support of small business utilization, but also on OAR's claims going forward. Um, so again, with that, um, we don't want to take up any more time uh, for everyone. We will continue to um, uh, reach out and touch base as we go forward. Um, we want to thank you all for attending and uh, continue to engage with us and with EPA. EPA is uh, a huge advocate, advocate for small businesses, and we're looking forward to working with each of you uh, in the future. So thanks again, everyone.